My name is Victoria Kalmanovic, and I'm an engineering manager. Currently, I'm a software team lead at Aspectiva, which is a Walmart company. We're an Israeli-based startup that was acquired by Walmart last year. I lead the software team, and we build lots of cool experiences based on our NLP and AI solutions. In previous roles, I was a lieutenant commander in the Israeli Navy. I served as a software developer in the Navy's technological unit. I went through several roles, including a programmer of defense systems, an algorithm developer for autonomous vehicles, and as head of R&D of a major software group. And about a year ago, I was right at a crossroads between staying in the Navy versus looking for a new path. Let me tell you about the unit I served at. This unit is like a big software company. It consists of a few autonomous software organizations where each organization has a different purpose and different unrelated projects they work on. Each organization is led by its own CTO. Around the time when I was trying to find my next role, one of these autonomous organizations had an opening for the CTO role. This position was of a high rank, so that meant someone was about to get a promotion. The new elected CTO was a talented officer. I'd like to keep her privacy, so let's call her Jane. Jane got this promotion. Jane is a very talented software engineer and manager. She has many years of experience. She's very known around the unit. And of all the candidates, she had been the one person who stood out as the one who could take the unit to the next level professionally. Jane had been the most professionally qualified candidate by a mile. It was a known fact. But it was the hallway discussions that followed her promotions that got me thinking. Many people believe that her promotion was a token promotion. People said that because there's all these gender equality movements, the chosen person for this job had to be Jane because she was a woman. Everyone's first instinct, both men and women, was she got the job because of a superficial need for diversity and not because she was the best candidate. I've been volunteering for diversity in tech for several years by then. I was organizing hackathons and software architecture workshops and mentoring women in software. I was used to seeing underrepresentation of women in leading positions, and I was focused on increasing this representation through many initiatives. However, this specific event caught me by surprise, since even after she got the job, the general approach was still biased, which got me to investigate further. It got me thinking, why was it so weird for me that, people, that people's first instinct was to diss this promotion and not say, for example, hey, great job, she deserves this promotion because of her skills. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today. How we, as managers, can make sure we build a bias-aware environment for all of our developers. To do that, we'll talk about what kind of biases are out there, how they might affect our work environment, and what we can do about it. We'll go back to Jane later, but first let's discuss what kind of biases are out there. And to do that, we'll walk through some diversity and inclusion myths. This first one is, raising awareness is not important. It's best to let diversity and inclusion happen naturally. As I said before, mentoring others has always been my passion. On the first year as a software developer, I mentored high school girls in a program which was designed to make computer science more accessible to girls. This program started because the numbers of girls who attended computer science faculties in Israel were very, very low. In this program, I would go to different schools and talk to girls about computer science. I would explain about courses and what my day-to-day -day looks like in the, as a software engineer in the high-tech industry. And this one time, I came to talk to a group of high school girls. This was almost 10 years ago, but I still remember it so vividly because it was such an important encounter for me. I talked about how very few women go to study computer science and that the numbers are low mostly because of conscious and unconscious gender tracking. Now, gender tracking is the practice of directing the education of male and female students into different paths based on gender and social norms and expectations. Sometimes this tracking is systematic and conscious and sometimes it is unconscious. It starts very early when we're very young and we can see and we can see these exa examples every day. For example, let's look at the clothes. Girls wear pink, boys wear blue. On the playground, when a boy climbs a tree, we see it as a positive trait. Oh, look at him, such a rascal. When a girl climbs a tree, we tell her to watch out. This can lead to many phenomena. Girls might be less competitive in order to beware of falling, for example. Gender tracking also encompasses more subconscious aspects, such as gender expectations from teachers and peer pressure to conform to social norms. 
For example, a boy is having a hard time with math and the teachers and parents' first instinct might be to tell him to suck it up and be a man. On the other hand, a girl having a hard time, the teachers and parents' first instinct might be to let her off the hook and say, maybe it is too hard for you. Maybe it's better for you to drop from advanced math and go back to intermediate math. This might not be a conscious distinction we make, but it's something society tells us about what men and women should be capable of. Social tracking starts early, but affects the decisions we make as grown-ups. Going back to the girls I talked about, um, the girls had a hard time listening to the part about gender tracking. They said they didn't feel any different than the boys. They said they make their own decisions based on their set of principles and never based on what society says. They said that creating spaces for girls only, that's what creates a deeper rift between the genders. Their teacher, who sat with us the whole time, said that only once we stop paying attention to the issue of gender, only then will there be equality. This talk went slightly different than what I'd expected, but this was very important discussion and it was even more important because of what had happened next. Usually during the last part of my presentation, I show a short video on how awesome engineering is. This last part is intended for both boys and girls, since there's always need for more engineers of all genders. The boys who were waiting outside up until that moment came back into the class for the video. And after the short video, I would ask the class some follow-up questions and allow the kids to lead a free discussion. Before the boys came in, all the girls were talking freely, raising their hands and having a passionate discussion with each other and with me. Once the boys came into class, not even one hand was raised in the air. Not even one of those girls spoke up. I really wanted to believe the things they said earlier that they feel their voices heard, that they can safely state their views and that their behavior isn't influenced by the boys in their class. But that wasn't the case. They felt uncomfortable to raise their hands, uncomfortable to say anything that the boys might mock and uncomfortable sharing any of their thoughts in front of the boys. The solution I came up with at that moment with those children was simply to raise awareness of what had happened without even noticing how all the girls just went quiet this was a call for action from both girls and boys of that classroom. The girls needed to be aware of why no one was raising her hand. Was it because she really had nothing to say or because they were worried the boys would mock them? And the boys needed to be aware that things they say might affect someone from wanting to speak up. But it's important to understand the role society has when we make decisions. We don't always make an aware decision to behave the way we do. I don't always make an aware decision to not raise my hand when there's a boy in my class or make an aware choice to raise my voice when there's only girls in my class. Society has a major role in these unconscious behaviors. We need to be aware of social tracking in order to be able to avoid it. For example, social tracking is there when we need to decide what to study, which basically decides our entire future, where we're going to work and how much money we're going to make. Let's look at computer science, for example. This decision actually starts at a very early age. Let's look at the decrease from year to year. Girls between the ages of 11 and 14, 46% of them would consider a career in engineering. This number drops between the ages of 14 and 16 to 42%. And between the ages of 16 and 18, when it's like one second before college, this number drops to only 25% which affects the numbers later, later on. Less women will go to computer science faculties, less women will graduate, which will ultimately lead to less women engineers. For example, nowadays, only 12% of all engineers in the UK are women. This comes as a bit of a surprise since computer science was basically dominated by women in the early days of last century. Here you can see Ada Lovelace, an English mathematician and writer. She's believed to have published the first algorithm. She's regarded as one of the first to be a computer programmer. She even has her own programming language named after her, Ada. Another great example is Grace Hopper, an American computer scientist and United States Navy Admiral. You can see how I can relate to her. It's thanks to her that computer languages look the way they do nowadays. It was her notion that a programming language based on English was possible. She's responsible for the COBOL language, and even her nickname is Grandma COBOL. She's responsible for the compiler. And it's her who coined the term bug and debugging when an actual moth was found on the relay she was working on. So what happened to all the women in computer science? It is believed, and there are lots of statistics to show its effect, that Silicon Valley's, and consequently the world's, gender gap 
is the result of computer game marketing 30 something years ago. It's no coincidence that this is called a Game Boy. This led to something called the experience gap since boys had experience with computers and girls didn't. And this led to a more positive attitude towards computers in general, which led to more boys working in software. So we know there's a gap. And that story I told you about the girls and the boys, that was 10 years ago. Haven't a lot of things changed since then? I mean, we have Sheryl Sandberg and the Lenin organization, our very own Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot, a first time US Vice President, Kamala Harris. But remember Jane? That wasn't 10 years ago, that was last year. It was 2020 and people were saying she got promoted because she was a woman and didn't even look at her credentials. And I understand now what was missing for me. It was to have a high rank boss addressing these hallways conversations and accusations out loud. I wanted the management to simply say, she was chosen because she was the most qualified. Saying out loud that implying it was based on gender was like taking away all her years of professional successes and achievements. People should have been aware that when they speak in a diminishing way, implying that women can't possibly be good enough for a high rank role, this might prevent other women from ever trying to get there. And this keeps the status quo of more men being considered for promotions or more men speaking up at meetings. So it's up to all of us, all genders alike, to be aware and break the cycle, change the status quo. We can hope for equality and inclusion and expect it to just happen. Unfortunately, it won't occur out of nowhere. There are behaviors and biases we have which are deeply assimilated within us. When we are aware of these behaviors and biases, that's when we can really make a difference. Awareness is key, and awareness can only be raised when we actively talk about these topics in the open. And even though employers may be positive about creating diversity within their companies, we're about to see how diversity can actually be achieved by taking action. So how can you take action? This leads us to the second myth. Those of us who deal with raising awareness to gender diversity and inclusion in their workplace probably hear this a lot. We hire talent based on performance and not based on gender. So it all starts with finding a job. Before onboarding a new hire onto a bias aware environment, we need to hire them first. So let's see what could possibly happen during the hiring process. I help many women with perfecting their CVs. There are some common things I see with most of my mentees. It starts with the word bragging. My mentees have a hard time stating their achievements since they look at it as bragging. What if they have many achievements? They don't write all of them or make some of them sound less than they are. We can say, so what? They choose how to present themselves. The point is they present themselves to interviewers and these interviewers, us, see many types of CVs by both men and women. Here is an example I took from a blog called Tech Savvy Women. You see two resumes here. The first one is of a female senior software engineer named Emma. The second is of a male senior software engineer named William. You can see the highlighted key phrases in each example. Notice the, the woman writes in a paragraph form using collaborative terms like worked on and partnering, which can be seen as passive. While the men uses much stronger verbs like drove, oversaw, and designed, active action taking. Before you even have a chance to meet face to face, people are making judgments about your ability to do the job based on the terms you use in your resume. This is called the resume gap. We see that women tend to place less emphasis on specific details of previous jobs. They're more likely to write a detailed summary of their work as a whole, as opposed to describing each and every one of their previous roles in detail. Although they're including their job titles, they don't tend to go into detail of each and every one of their jobs and achievements individually, as men tend to do. The gap in resumes comes from a difference in how women and men present themselves through language and form, and not how qualified they actually might be for the job. If we as employers understand the resume gap and be more aware of it when we filter out candidates, only then will we be able to judge the actual achievements. Another practical tip I can give you, if you're not sure if you're dealing with a resume gap, when I see a resume that I feel uses a little bit too many passive and collaborative verbs or tells a general story and not the details, I make a short phone call and ask about these specific roles in more detail. This usually gives me my answer. In 10 minutes, I know if I should continue with this candidate or not. Another thing I hear quite often is, how can we hire women when we don't get enough female CVs or don't get them at all? Let's talk about job descriptions. 
We've all seen these job descriptions where the employers are looking for ninjas and rock stars and a person who has six years experience in a framework which only exists two. In many cases, job descriptions contain words that are gender biased. For me, for example, it's not obvious that some words have different effect on, on different people. So I use this chart when I need to write a job description because I want my candidate pool to be as big and as diverse as it gets. I don't want to limit myself with people. This is a chart I took from LinkedIn. They have a course on gender biases and plenty of reading materials if you're interested. This chart tells us that using words like strong or competitive drives female candidates away. Studies show female professionals are much less likely to apply to jobs with these male sounding words in their job descriptions. And there's the other side to that as well. Using words like nurturing or sensitive can, can also keep male candidates from applying. So either way, you're limiting your total talent pool. Take a look through your job descriptions to spot these biased words and replace them with neutral languages wherever possible. These two handy charts can help you get started. Another fact is, if you list a gigantic list of requirements, females will be less inclined to send, to send their CVs unless they feel they can check all the requirements. Men, on the other hand, will send their CV to a role even when they don't have all requirements listed in the job description. This can also explain why we get less female CVs. And to be practical, there are many techniques for writing job descriptions. Here you can see two descriptions from the same company, but written in two different ways. If we want to enlarge our talent pool, this is something we need to work on. We can take a look at our job descriptions, some of the job descriptions we posted, make some changes, and see how that, how that improves the, the amount of female CVs we get. Enlarging the talent pool can really help us get the perfect candidate. Words matter, like we see here. That's true, we did advertise for someone who works well under pressure. But is that the candidate we were looking for? Let's move on to the interview itself. The same gaps we saw between the resumes apply during the interview itself. Let's see the hiring process and find how we can debias it. Some common phenomena I see during mock interviews with female software developers is not speaking with authority or confidence during the interview and underselling achievements. This requires training for certain people, and that's training I do with the women I mentor. It starts with the self-presentation and might continue when the candidate presents their skills and achievements. During mock interviews, I give feedback on what's missing in the presentation or where the person sounded a little bit unconfident. When I'm conducting a real interview as opposed to a mock interview, and I see someone struggling with going in detail about achievements or I spot the candidate feels unconfident, I lead the conversation. I ask questions that allow the person to speak of their successes. I'll try to recognize where the person feels more confident and remain there for a while. Ask questions about that topic. Recognizing lack of confidence can help reduce stress levels, and it can help me reveal the candidate's true strengths underneath all those levels of stress. Remember, a person with less confidence during a job interview doesn't mean they're less qualified for the job. As an interviewer, it's also up to us to be aware we don't hurt the interviewee's confidence during the interview. Some people tend to lose confidence if the interviewer doesn't talk much, or if they say things like, I have to go to another meeting, or if they're on edge, and there are many more examples. What I work on with women I mentor is to be as calm as possible, have a conversation with the interviewer, stay confident no matter what happens. We as interviewers need to be aware of our body language and how we behave during the interview. And now when the entire hiring and onboarding process is done remotely, it's even more important to be aware of our behaviors and how they pass online through the screen to the person we're interviewing. And this is true for every interview we conduct. Our goal is to help this person pass, not to fail them. And what happens when the interview is over? We take our time, we write the feedback, and this helps us decide what happens with the candidate. Do we continue the hiring process with them? Do we not? But let's look at the other side for a minute. What goes on in the candidate's minds? The candidate doesn't see all these considerations we take into account when we decide if we continue with them or not. So it could help if we provide feedback at the end of the process. But don't give feedback just to give feedback and get it over with. This feedback needs to be accurate and constructive. A bad example is you really failed the test or your code was in low quality. 
This is not helpful. <laughs> this won't allow the other person to build off of this feedback. It will only make them feel really bad about, about themselves. Actionable, fe actionable feedback is better. You need to strengthen your skills when using this framework, or you completed the task without paying attention to edge cases and testing. Include examples from the interview to back this feedback up. Remember, a good and memorable hiring process makes the company look good, and people could still recommend the company to their friends, even when they didn't get the job, simply based on a good hiring experience. In conclusion, the myth we talked about here was, we choose performers based on their performance and not based on gender. Of course, we need to choose the best candidates, but we need to make sure our candidate pool is diverse enough. And by making slight changes to your hiring process, you can make the hiring process in your team or company more bias aware and approachable to women as well as men. Which brings us back to the story I told you in the beginning about Jane. On this section, we'll talk about why we see so few women in leading management positions and how we can create a more aware environment, which will be more positive for our developers. So we started talking about the leaky tech pipeline in the beginning and how it all starts with educating our children. But let's focus on the last section of the pipeline, the executives. Over the past five years, we've seen sites of progress in the rep representation of women in America. Since 2015, the number of women in senior leadership has grown. Take a look at the C-suite. The representation of women there has increased from 17% to 21%. That's a lot. Although this is a step in the right direction, women are underrepresented at every level. And without fundamental changes early in the pipeline, gains in women's representation will ultimately stall. What can we do to improve the numbers? More women are becoming senior leaders, and this is driven by two trends. First, more women are being hired at the director level and higher than in the past years. Second, senior le level women are being promoted on average at a higher rate than men. Additionally, men at the senior VP and C levels are slightly more likely to leave their companies, which creates more open positions for women to fill. But something called a broken rung prevents women from reaching the top. The biggest obstacle women face on the path to senior leadership is at the first step up to manager. For every 100 men promoted and hired to a first time manager position, only 72 women are promoted and hired. This broken rung results in more women getting stuck at the entry level and fewer women becoming managers. This early inequality has a long-term impact on the talent pipeline. The number of women decreases at every subsequent le level. <clears throat> so the numbers make it very clear. But why does this happen? There are many reasons. I'll only focus on three, which I think are the key points. First reason to consider is social stigmas and how women might be perceived. The first reason is similar to gender tracking, the, gen the same gender tracking we've talked about before. The things we usually hear are how we sometimes look at people who do the same job differently. For example, a man can be seen as assertive, that they can get the job done, while a woman can be perceived as aggressive, where no one takes her seriously when she's angry. Or young male CEOs can be seen as young and enthusiastic versus young female CEOs who can be perceived as young and inexperienced. Same attributes, but a different, a different view of the society of, of both. This can also be seen during meetings where women might be heard less or suffer from microaggressions around the office. There are even researchers stating that many women are perceived to be in a more junior role than they actually are. Think about the last time you went with a woman to an elevator before all this coronavirus. But other than the language we use and how we perceive gender, different, gender differently, it comes down to the office culture. There are some phenomena in the high-tech industry, which is male-dominated, that might lead to less women in power positions. For example, boys' night out, where the guys go out for drinks after work. This is not a problem, of course, but this needs attention. For example, if a male boss spends more time with his male colleagues, this might ultimately lead to him wanting to promote them. Or another common scenario, we go out for drinks, but we make professional decisions. This affects not only promotions, but also excludes the people who weren't there from having a say on professional matters. Boys groups within the office could also lead to very unpleasant situations, 
office WhatsApp groups where, for example, se sexual subjects are discussed, or worse, WhatsApp groups that exclude the women of the office in order to speak of subjects unfitting for a work environment. The important thing to understand, these scenarios are all based on real examples that happened in more than one company. Now, most of the time, on most of the teams, there will be a majority of guys. If scenarios like this happen, we make it hard on women to enjoy their work. We make it hard for them to be passionate about their work. We limit ourselves to hiring only men who don't mind the culture or women who suffer in order to be seen as one of the gang. Fact is, we can include more people in conversations or in WhatsApp groups or in company night outs. We can avoid talking about inappropriate things at work. And this will probably make the workplace a lot better with much more inclusive and pleasant culture. And isn't that what we all want? To work at a place that makes me smile when I wake up in the morning. So as we said, office culture can also delay promotions. The third reason to consider is the notion that women should be able to successfully clone the male competitive model. So why shouldn't there be as many female managers as there are male managers, right? Fact is, managers on average work a lot of hours. <laughs> on average, it's somewhere between 50 and 70 hours a week. The major problem with that equality notion is that husbands have not picked up a significant share of women's traditional responsibilities at home. Even high-achieving women who are married continue to carry many domestic responsibilities. Women pay an even greater price for those long hours because the early years of career building overlap almost perfectly the prime years of childbearing. Women end up apologizing for wanting it all. And at some point, it seems like too much. So there's a great amount of women who pass on promotions and even leave the high-tech industry completely. This is the harsh reality behind the myth of having it all. Ruth Bader Ginsburg said it best, women will have achieved true quality when men share with them the responsibility of bringing up the next generation. Women can't run everything. They can't do full-time at excelling at work and full-time at running a household. They can't do the first shift and the second shift. Some things we as managers can't be accountable for, but let's do everything in our power wherever we can. So the good news is we can de-bias the promotion process and even make a more balanced environment for all of our developers while we're de-biasing. The first practical thing we need to do is think of performance reviews with special attention to any upcoming promotions. Let's make sure our company has the right processes in place to prevent bias from creeping into performance reviews and consequently into promotions. This means establishing clear evaluation criteria before the review process begins. For example, a rating scale is generally more effective than an open-ended assessment. Remember how open-ended assessments can lead to the same attribute of a person, for example, aggressive, but sometimes it's perceived as negative and sometimes as positive based on the gender? Without exception, candidates for the same role should be evaluated using the same criteria. There are even companies that find it using a third party in the room is helpful, so that when evaluators discuss candidates, the subjective third party can highlight potential bias and encourage objectivity. So being aware of criteria for promotions is important, but we also need to review our processes for making promotions and filling vacancies. There must be a growing proportion of experienced women building up in the pipeline. Find them, help them advance, mentor them, and enlist them in the effort to overcome onlyness, being the only woman of a team, being the only woman of a company. Because being the only person in the room is hard and pressuring in many ways. But it is also critical that women get the experience they need to be ready for management roles, as well as opportunities to raise their profile so they get tapped for them. The proportion of women at entry level has to rise in order to close the gap. The building blocks to make this happen are not new. Leadership training, sponsorship, mentoring, high profile assignments so that everybody in the company gets to know this person and see its, its true value. But many companies need to understand first why it's so crucial for them to provide it. Just think about how amazing it is to turn your developers into the best managers. We actually get to create managers. There's nothing more satisfying than watching someone you promote grow, 
learn new skills and becomes a good manager. Which leads to my last point of work-life balance. Hiring and promoting needs to be a goal we need to strive for. Companies need to understand this will benefit them. They need to think of policies for equality to avoid losing their great employees over this second shift. And this can be done in various forms, maternity and paternity leave and pay, or flexible start or finish times, the opportunity to work from home, which is now what we all do, childcare facilities or some sort of vouchers, depending on the country, health insurance, and many more. Allow both dads and moms to have this work-life balance. So we see that long before we actually onboard a new member on our team, and long before we actually go ahead and promote that new engineer of ours, we bring in lots of unconscious biases. So today we went ahead and busted three common myths. We talked about how raising awareness is important and positive, what actions we can take in order to increase our talent pool and make it more diverse, and how it's up to us to create more entry-level female managers and why it will make our workplace much more inclusive and pleasant. But now is the real test. Do we reinforce all this new knowledge into our workspace? Where to even begin? I wrote a blog post with practical tips and I invite you all to start there. Read a little bit, watch some videos. You don't have to apply everything I spoke about here all at once. Even Rome wasn't built in a day. But remember what Reagan said. Status quo, you know, is Latin for the mess we're in. To break down the barriers that hold women back, it's not enough to spread awareness. If we don't reinforce that people need and want to overcome their biases, we end up silently condoning the status quo. So let's make the world a better place for everyone. Thank you very much for being with me today. I hope this talk was helpful and feel free to connect with me for more reading materials and tips. Thanks again and see you soon.